how are maps created from imagery? So first of all, we need to understand the image processing sequence. So this provides a framework for how we analyze problems to which we apply remote sensing. So first out, we start with the problem definition, then look at actually acquiring data, step into image pre-processing, image enhancement, information extraction, error assessment, multi-temporal analysis, and information communication to solve the problem that was presented in the first place. This part is only going to look at the first two stages. So we're really going to delve into defining the problem and figuring out how we can acquire data to match what the problem is requiring. So within that, there's a number of steps that we need to look at. First of all, we have to define the critical subject information requirements. Then we need to also consider if there's any additional information about the environment in which the subject is situated that is going to either provide an impediment or also aid our interpretation. From there, we determine what our ideal sensor dimensions are. So what would the optimal sensor, satellite or airborne actually look like? And then we have to actually trade this off for what is actually available. So in this stage, we select an appropriate sensor to meet our requirements. And this is not always what our ideal or optimal situation looks like. So a little bit more information about really understanding the critical information that we need to get into the problem and figure out what sensor is requ required. So we start with the critical subject information so this is really all about defining information about the subject that you're interested in and looking at what its spatial characteristics are, so its general location, can you access it for field survey for example, what is the minimum size of the feature that you're interested in, so are you interested in looking at individual trees, leaves, forests, what is that scale that's, that's required. And how big of an area do you need to cover to answer your problem? So are you looking at continental scales or more regional? Or perhaps you're just interested in a, in a local city area? You also need to know if there are any particular times of year or the day that are going to be useful for you to acquire imagery. So perhaps you're interested in a particular type of vegetation that you know flowers in the in the dry season or or a particular time of year so that might be the time of year in which you need to ensure that you're acquiring data that's appropriate for that so next we step into looking at what are the particular color information pieces that we need about that subject so is there any particular light reflection or absorption characteristics about that subject that we need to know so does it have a particular signature in the near infrared or shortwave infrared or in a particular really narrow wavelength for example particularly if you're looking at minerals is there any relevant temperature information that's required? So are we then going to need to look at potentially acquiring some thermal information? We also need to consider if there's any critical contextual information that is going to aid us in our image processing and analysis as well. So this really comes out in, in terms of bringing in additional data sets that, that might be useful to assist us with solving a problem. At this initial stage, we also need to determine what the accuracy requirements are. So is it something that you need to obtain an 80% accuracy, for example, because this is going to go into forming some policy or meeting some requirements? Or is this the sort of thing that the managers are happy to have anything that they can get because something is better than nothing? And finally, you need to look at if there are any existing data available or classification schemes that you can work to. So that's all about this subject. We also need to then consider information about the environment in which the subject sits. So this might include information about cloud cover. So are there, are there, are there particular times of year when it's going to be very difficult to obtain imagery because of cloud cover? Or do you need to then go to looking at radar, for example? 
You also need to consider if there are any obscuring features. So if you're looking at grasses that occur underneath tree canopies, how do we get at that? And what are the sorts of sensors that might allow us to do that? Or even if you're looking at submerged features, so maybe seagrass or coral that's actually under a body of water. So we need to consider how we get through that water too. And if there's any additional information about any environmental movement, so winds or currents that might affect our data acquisition or interpretation. Finally, we need to link this with sensor options. So this is really considering all available sensors and their spectral resolution. So the number of bands that they have, where those bands are located and the full width at half max or the band width of those of individual bands. What is the spatial detail of available sensors? So their, their pixel size and the extent that the images cover. And how frequently are they available? So what is their revisit frequency overpass? And finally, how much money do you have for the project? So is this something that you're going to have to resort to freely available data or can you task satellites or airborne systems as well? So all these pieces need to fit together in order to be able to define an ideal sensor. And so the way that we then go about doing this is to look at the individual information requirements and then link that to potential data sources. So if you have a look at the table on the top and you look and what I've done here is to split this into spatial, spectral and temporal domains. And if we consider the information requirement, a low spatial information requirement might be something on a national scale. So I might be interested in mapping something over all of Australia. At the medium resolution, that might be regional, so potentially Northern Territory or, or the Greater Darwin area. Um, but a high spatial information would be looking at an individual town or city, for example. So if I then link that to potential data sources, so data sets that have low spatial resolution and would be useful for mapping at a national scale might be something like MODIS or ABHRR. At that medium range, we could look at SPOT, Landsat, ASTA, AVNIR, and a number of other different sensors that are available through the various space agencies around the world. But if we're interested in high spatial information, uh, local areas, for example, then we need to step to QuickBird, Iconos, GOI, Worldview, those types of high spatial information sensors, or potentially even aerial photography. So that's in the spatial domain, and you can see directly how they link between the information requirement and the types of sensors that we might use to address that. So then we step over to spectral. So Something that would have a low spectral information requirement might be distinguishing the difference between vegetation and building boundaries, perhaps. At the next stage, we might be interested in land cover types or biomass. And at the high level of information requirement, we're really considering individual plant species recognition, identifying minerals or potentially constituents within a water column. So if we then step down and link that to potential data sources, Low spectral information sensors are panchromatic sensors. So there are several panchromatic sensors available on a variety of different satellites, and these are often offered as a high spatial resolution component to that satellite. So you, you could be looking at Landsat, Spot, QuickBird, Iconos, Worldview, a range of those different ones that all have the panchromatic band. In the medium spectral range, you'd be looking at a multispectral satellite. So again, SPOT, Landsat, ASTAR, QuickBird and Iconos. And you can see that these sensors all have varying spatial resolutions associated with that spectral resolution there as well. But if we're interested in looking at plant species recognition, minerals, etc., we need a hyperspectral sensor. So options there might be HIMAP, or, which is an like airborne sensor, CASI, another one, or Hyperion for a satellite option there. And then finally, we look at the temporal information requirements. Are you interested in looking at something that varies annually, seasonally, or daily, for example, and may represent, represent our low, medium, and high level information requirements? We link this through to a potential data source. Most platforms and sensors will give us annual information as same sort of thing with seasonal. But if we get to a daily level 
requirement for temporal information, we're really stepping down to MODIS and AVHRR and a couple of other sensors that are in that realm as well. So what you can see here is that it's not possible to get a hyperspectral sensor that is going to acquire data for you every day, for example. So there's always going to be these trade-offs between linking your information requirement with the potential data source and identifying what your ideal option is compared to what's actually going to be available. Now to link this through to an actual application, I wanted to step through those first two stages of the image processing sequence to really help you understand how we go through this process. So I'm going to do this with an application. And for this application, I've chosen to look at landslide remote sensing. And the scenario is that widespread landsliding actually frequently occurs following some significant storms in northern New Zealand. And the question is, can remote sensing be used to identify the extent of areas affected? So to do this, I've come up with a bit of a, a mind map of how I've gone through in individual stages. And you can use that website that's linked there to go through this interactively if you like as well. But we're going to just look firstly at the problem. So these are some examples of the landslides that we're talking about. So there's, there's a picture on the upper left here. We've got a couple of people down at the bottom of the landslide. So this is a fairly significant sized one. Um, a coastal one here and some ones in some paddocks here. So this gives you a bit of a context of what they actually look like. So the first thing that I needed to do was to really define those critical subject information requirements. So I've looked at it and said, okay, the minimum size landslide that I'd like to map is five by one meters. And the extent of, it, of the area of interest is to the north of Auckland, which is in northern New Zealand. And it's a generally relatively large area that I'm interested in. In terms of the color of different features on the ground, they're bright in the visible. They have a low reflectance in the near infrared because of the lack of vegetation of that cleared landslide area. And they have a high shortwave infrared reflectance. Temporally, I would like to get the information immediately following a storm. So I can't necessarily plan in advance when this is going to occur, but I would like to be able to probably task a satellite to be able, or, an, or an airborne system to be able to acquire immediately when, when that event actually happens. In terms of access, there's no permits required, but I, I potentially will need to use a boat to be able to get to the coastal landslides um, and also know where the road access is. And the other cues for context information that's really important to know is that generally the landslides are only going to occur on relatively steep slopes, so it's not, this is not going to happen on a flat land. So that will help me cut out certain areas of, of an image. And also they tend to occur in areas where the land has been previously cleared of native vegetation. So stepping that down then into my requirements in terms of imagery, if I want a minimum, pix a minimum size of a feature that I'm interested in is five by one meters. This means that the minimum pixel size that I'd like is a half meter pixel. We generally work on a one to 10 ratio. So get the, the pixel size, a tenth the size of the feature that you're interested in there. So I've got a relatively large aerial extent and I'm going to require multispectral um, data. Broadband is probably fine. Um, I'd like to be able to request an acquisition. And another issue or potential issue there is that given that I want to require information immediately following a storm, I might have issues with, with cloud cover there immediately following the rain. In terms of access, I'm going to need to acquire a map of the local area. It also might be useful for me to get a hold of a DEM so that I can create a slope layer so I can look at areas where there's actually high probability of landslides occurring. And a land cover map would probably be of use as well. So now I can start to link to potential data sources there. So First of all, if we start to look here, that I've, I've said that I want my minimum pixel size to be a half meter. So that would lead me to suggest that I need to use the panchromatic band of, of QuickBird, QuickBird or Worldview 2, for example. However, this 
contradicts my requirements for a large aerial extent, which would suggest that I need to use Spot, Landsat, Eidos, Aster, etc. So there's a bit of a problem there. And then I also say that I'd like to use multispectral data, of which panchromatic band doesn't actually form, in, form into that category. So I'm going to have to make some decisions about what the most important thing is there. Now, I've, because I've said that there might be a problem with cloud cover, I've suggested the radar might be an option for me to use, but I do know that radar is also very expensive. However, it can be tasked. So if I, if I needed to get a radar sat image immediately, um, I, could, I could task the Canadian Space Agency to get an image for me within a set window. But again, the price of that is quite expensive and it's not going to get me that half meter pixel size that I require. So I do also need to check the availability of getting a map of local areas and I'll probably download a digital elevation model there as well. And I might also want to look at any archive data to see if I can perform a change detection. So this is really important to understand the baseline characteristics of an environment and then obtain the after image, which is then going to allow me to see that it is a landslide or perhaps it was a feature that was already in the environment prior to that particular storm. But my biggest issue here is that I, I need to come up with a, with a compromise for what my requirements are because I can't match that spatial resolution with my required spatial extent or the spectral information that I need. So what we did was to decide that we'll use the spot sensor. So this is multispectral, but it also has a panchromatic band that we can acquire as well. We do have the ability to task that satellite, so that's always good. And it's, it's not going to get us the, the half meter pixel size that we, that we said that we needed, but it will give us a two and a half meter pixel size on the panchromatic band there. So we'll be able to use this in models to assist with understanding the, the size of the, the landslides and potentially look at some pan sharpening options there as well. So we've got a trade off there and it, it just means that we need to understand that we can no longer pick up the very smallest landslides in the landscape and we now have a minimum size that we can detect. And then we can also use QuickBird or WorldView 2 or Iconos, for example, in small areas to assist with calibration and validation of our model there. So again, there's the website that you can have a look at this uh, if you'd like to go in and have a look at it a little bit more interactively in a bit more detail as well.